I'll give them just another minute to get in. Good morning, Gina. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. We also have joining us Mr. Nate K. Johnson. He is the president of Real Estate Solutions at Red Key Realty Leaders and a full service uh, commercial and residential real estate brokerage with a commitment to helping clients achieve their real estate goals. Nate has served as the 2011 president of the St. Louis Association of Realtors, which represents eight, nearly 8,000 realtors. He has chaired several St. Louis Association Realtor Committees, including the Equal Opportunity and Cultural Diversity Committee, as well as the Urban Affairs Committee. Um, on the state level, Nate has been chairman of the Economic Development Council and currently serves on the leadership team as the 2018 president of the Missouri State Association of Realtors, which represents nearly 25,000 realtors. He was also a member of the Realtors, uh, Missouri Realtors Honor Society and was the 2017 chairman of the Smart Growth Advisory Board for the National Association of Realtors. Additionally, Nate serves as president of the board of directors for the Metropolitan St. Louis Equal Housing Opportunity Council. It is the only private, not-for-profit fair housing enforcement agency working to end illegal housing discrimination in the Metropolitan St. Louis area. Nate recently completed a four-year term as commissioner of the preservation board for the city of St. Louis. On a personal note, I had the great privilege and honor of working with Nate myself back in the uh, kind of mid-2006 to 2010. It was the years leading up to him serving as president of the St. Louis Association of Realtors. So I know firsthand uh, what an outstanding leader and, and gentleman this guy is, and we are so happy to have you joining us. Thank you for joining us, Nate. Thank you. Thank you, Tessa. Thank you, everybody. I'm really happy to be here. It's uh, uh, Thanks for, for allowing me to come and talk with you today. And um, yeah, we're gonna discuss a little bit about a really brief history of fair housing. Um, you know, I've had the honor to be a realtor now. This is my 21st year as a realtor. And what's interesting about that is for the first several years that I was a realtor, I had no idea about some of the challenges that, uh, that we faced in our communities historically and certainly coming to today as well. But as a young realtor, I didn't get that. So I worked to learn more and uh, get really gain an understanding of how we've arrived and how our communities have arrived in the way that they look today. So that's where I've come up with this really brief history of fair housing that we're going to talk about. So it all starts back in 1866. Anybody remember 1866? Anybody? What was happening? What was happening around that time? Anybody know what was happening around that time? Well, yes. What was taking place around 1866 is we had the end of the Civil War. End of the Civil War what happened, and we all of a sudden have these emancipated, uh, emancipated, freed, uh, enslaved people in our country that didn't really have any, there wasn't really a def defined, there wasn't anything defined about what to do with them. It was very tough. And what we know is that what we know is that um, in 1865, the civil rights law came to Congress or came to the president, the president, Andrew Johnson at the time, then vetoed the bill, sent it back. It came back again and was vetoed once again. And it was only through a two thirds majority vote that the Civil Rights Act of 1866 became law. And what happened there is it said such citizens of every race and color and without regard to previous condition of slavery or involuntary servitude shall have the same right in every state and territory to lease, to inherit, to purchase, to sell and hold and convey real and personal property, real estate, as is enjoyed by white citizens. So there we have it. 1866, that should have solved it all. We've got 
equal housing opportunity. Uh, we've, we've got the civil rights bill that becomes law. Um, discrimination in housing is over. Racism has ended. And no, nobody, nobody with me on that one? Okay, all right, absolutely. That is not exactly how it happened. So we've got to take it back a step just before that because what happened is that when the enslaved um, people of our country were freed, it wasn't like they were given 40 acres and a mule, which is what was prescribed by President Abraham Lincoln before his assassination. Andrew Johnson had a much different take on that. So when the folks were freed, it was basically, you're free now, bye, you didn't get anything. Um, you know, uh, again, you know, no land, there was no housing, you didn't even get a Holiday Inn hotel voucher, right? So you were just free to go. And unfortunately, that set, um, that set the freedmen and women of our country off on the wrong foot, you know, behind the eight ball, or further behind the eight ball, so to speak. And um, that sort of brought us and led us into the uh, sort of reconstruction period. During Reconstruction, what was happening is that, yes, African Americans had a lot of opportunities. There was a lot of freedom. There was a lot of integration in the neighborhoods that was taking place during those 20 years that uh, Reconstruction occurred. But then, once President Garfield at the time uh, promised to get the federal troops out of the South, should he be elected president, um, he got that support and was elected president and did exactly as he said. He got all the troops out of the South. So in essence, Reconstruction virtually ended and they went back to the ways that uh, the South was prior to that. That's when we saw the Jim Crow era coming into full force without having voting opportunities, without having, um, without having equal housing opportunities. All these things were just uh, obliterated overnight as soon as the federal troops left the South. So then we saw what we know as the Great Migration. In between, in 1910, uh, there were over 90% of African Americans lived in the South. But what we know is by 1970, just about 50% lived in the South. There was a great migration north to escape the oppressive conditions, the seemingly oppressive conditions that were taking place in the South. Um, you know, we know that there, is, there, was, a, there was a big problem with uh, incarceration because just because the enslaved people were set free doesn't mean that all of a sudden there isn't a need for people to work these plantations and farms that were that were being that were being um, where the, the labor was free and cheap based on the, the, the enslaved people that were working that land. So then it became a uh, practice to incarcerate these folks and rent them out as cheap labor to the plantation owners. So you went from the slave quarters to a prison cell and back out into the field for free because that was the arrangement that was made between the people that operated the, the prisons and, and jails and the plantation owners. So it was tough going for African Americans coming out of um, reconstruction there. So that led us, so that was, that was why the, the move towards the North for sort of greener pastures, so to speak, to, to escape some of those oppressive conditions. Unfortunately, they found a lot of the same conditions in the North as they found in the South. But that leads us to uh, the 1930s. So what was happening in the 1930s? Well, what we know what was happening was the Great Depression. We had the Great Depression. Um, there were soup lines. There was, um, you know, a sense that our fragile democracy may not survive. We saw the drumbeat of war, you know, going marching across Europe and uh, maybe starting to knock on our door a little bit as well here in this country. Prior to 1900, uh, less than half of Americans owned homes. So then, the, as part of the New Deal, which was signed by Franklin Delano Roosevelt at the time, in addition to the Tennessee Valley Authority uh, and other jobs programs, which were sort of created to put men back to work uh, during that time, and as you can imagine, we're putting white men back to work because the African Americans were 
uh, last hired and first fired. So when you have a depression, these folks are going to be most impacted by what is taking place and by some of these conditions. But also as part of this program, we saw the creation of the National Housing Act. The National Housing Act was passed in 1934. And what it did is it created the FHA. The FHA, as we know and love, the Federal Housing Administration, and its purpose was to make credit more available for lenders so that they can uh, provide a, a more seam, seam, streamlined transaction to help people achieve the goal of home ownership in our country. Because as I stated, prior to or, you know, around the 1900s, we had less than 50% home ownership in our country. And what our, 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 uh, our leaders understood is that when people have a uh, stake in the home ownership, they have a real stake in the communities that they live and work in, and they're more willing to pick up arms to defend it, uh, which is what was necessary as we made our way into World War II. As you see here, uh, pay rent to yourself, the happiness and wisdom of home ownership, all of that was a great, great marketing program, and it really worked to create a boom in housing um, from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. The problem there, especially once we get into the 40s and 50s, uh, we look at who these loans were issued to. Over 98% of all FHA insured mortgages were issued to Caucasians. So this again was a space where minorities were excluded from the opportunity to achieve home ownership and uh, by utilizing the FHA loan, which allowed for that low down payment. Uh, which we which 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 was necessary. So this here, this is what we call a red line map. This is the homeowners loan corporation from the city of St. Louis, actually, in 1940. And of course, we know redlining is denying and restricting loans to people in particular communities. And part of the FHA program at the time, unfortunately, had a lot of redlining associated with it. Uh, you, what we know is that they would only lend in communities that were homogenous and non-integrated. Uh, they had a preference for that. So it was a real big problem for African Americans and other minorities to invest in home ownership because the homes, the, because FHA was not insuring loans within those neighborhoods. Here's a, a, an example that you see here. This is from the city of Buffalo. You see in the red, the Evans Bank trade area. And then the areas in blue are identified as greater than 50% African-American and greater than 40% African-American. And what was taking place is that the Evans Bank would not lend money in those communities. And a big reason for that is that the government-backed mortgages, the FHA, would not insure those mortgages. So as a result, the bank would lend in those communities. And it really further depressed some of the already depressed areas and neighborhoods, and that's where the redlining comes into play. And well, a couple of other things that you see on here is, uh, are some signs. We want white tenants in our white community. This track is exclusive and restricted. Jews only, uh, excuse me, Christians only, Jews not welcome, no Irish, no blacks, no dogs. Those types of things were very prevalent at the time. And the challenge that we have today in 2020 is that in 1950, it was overt racism that we saw with signs. Today, the racism still exists and the housing discrimination still exists. It's just not as overt. It is much more covert. And that is in many ways a bigger problem and a bigger challenge that we have to overcome than when we saw signs in yards. Because when we saw the signs in the yards and in the front of a neighborhood that said, uh, we want white tenants in our white community. We knew where people stood. We knew where people stood. Now we don't necessarily know when people are being discriminated against. And again, that makes it a bit more challenging. Now in your market, of course, you are aware of Levittown. So Levittown, as we know, is the name of one of seven large subdivision, uh, suburban town, uh, suburban housing developments that were created back in the 40s. Now this was 1947. So what was happening in our country in 1947? 1947, what we had happening, of course, was the end of World War II. We had the soldiers coming home from overseas from the war and we had a severe housing shortage. We had a severe housing shortage and we had to figure out what we were gonna do with all these folks that needed housing. 
and uh, William Levitt uh, created this great model about how to build these homes in a sort of assembly line style. I mean, they were turning out a home every three days, which is phenomenal. Now, when we look at, you know, we think we've got a housing shortage today. I don't know about your market, but my market here in St. Louis, we definitely have a housing shortage. But at the time that this development was opened in 1947, what we saw is that in the first three hours that they took reservations, they reserved 1,400 homes, 1,400 homes in three hours. That's a housing shortage for you, okay? There was a big demand for housing. And um, as you uh, may have guessed that there was a, uh, as, you, as you may have guessed, there was a restriction that stated that that limited the homes to residents of the Caucasian race. And that was stipulated in all the agreements. Now, taking just a quick step back here to this, to this slide, you see some verbiage there. And it says, none of the said lands uh, shall be inherited, leased, conveyed, used, occupied, owned, or acquired in any way by anyone of Negro blood, the Semitic race, uh, or, or Armenians, Jews, Hebrews, Persians, or Syrians. We know this is a restrictive covenant. This was very prevalent at the time. This was one of the ways that neighborhoods got around some of the other regulations that may have existed, federal regulations that did allow for integrated housing, uh, which, we're, which we're gonna talk about here in just a moment. Uh, so going back to Levittown, they had such a restrictive covenant. There was a restrictive covenant that said just that, that uh, Caucasians only. So by the time this development was complete, we're talking about 7,000 homes or so, and not one African-American or other minority was able to occupy that home. Now let's look at the times. When we look at how much these homes cost, the investment of these homes, uh, the investment that people made was a very, very modestly priced homes. African-Americans could afford to buy homes in this neighborhood. They were, just they were just forbidden from doing so. And they were forced to buy homes on, uh, in the neighborhoods on the other side of the track, so to speak. Uh, the homes where things were allowed in those communities that uh, we would never want in, in, in the community, that you, would, that you would fight to not have. Liquor stores, it'd be next to the pig farm. You'd have the highway running through it. You'd have uh, an industrial chemical plant or something like that, some waste, some other types of smelly solvents that are occurring uh, in, the, in the context of the neighborhood. So you would have these things occurring in these neighborhoods which helped to sort of suppress the values because in 1947, in Levittown, you would have spent the equivalent of today, which would be about $100,000 in today's dollars uh, back then. It was like seven or $8,000, something in that neighborhood. And to, to put it in context, we're talking about homes that were valued at twice the income, twice the median income uh, at, at the time, okay? Twice the median income. Okay, so that was very affordable. But today, you know, we look several generations later in the next several generations, what we see is that those homes are now selling at seven to eight times the median national income. So the opportunity to create, um, to, cre to invest in home ownership uh, in that in Levittown has ar had already passed by uh, those that weren't the sort of early adopters or, able, or, or those that were it had passed by those that weren't granted access to invest in those neighborhoods. Because when we look at the adjacent, so to speak, neighborhoods that were the African-American communities, um, they were trading at two times the national median income in 1947. And today, they're still trading at about that same rate. So you've seen very little to zero appreciation and wealth accumulation occurring in the context of those communities, as opposed to what was occurring in the exclusive white only communities. And that effectively created the middle class as we know it today, because prior to that, the middle class didn't really exist. And wealth that was accumulated through home ownership, uh, among other factors, worked to create that middle class that we all see and that we all enjoy today. Um, so that leads us to 1948. So 1948, we have a Supreme Court decision. So this is Shelley versus Kramer. And what happened here is that the Supreme Court made a decision. Now, in my opinion, they punted a little bit. They didn't go as far as they could have as it relates to addressing restrictive covenants. And what they said is this, 
the restrictive racially based covenants on their face are not invalid under the 14th Amendment. However, there will not be any state action or judicial action to intervene if private parties want to um, either enforce the restrictive covenant or ignore the restrictive covenant. What that means is if I own a home and, well, I'm a black guy, I wouldn't be able to own a home in the neighborhood. Let's just say that. Okay, so I am going to buy a home. Someone wants to sell me a home. So, okay, let's go there. Someone wants to sell me a home. Neighbor A says, oh, yeah, Nate, I'll sell you a home, no problem. So what's supposed to happen is the courts, the judicial system, the police, all of that are going to stay out of it. The neighbor A sells me the home. I move in with my family. Everything is great. That's what's supposed to happen. Okay. Also, if I go to neighbor B and say, hey, neighbor B, I want to buy your home. Neighbor B says, no, you're black. We've got restrictive covenants, and I'm not going to sell my home to an African-American. They could say that same thing. I would just have to leave and go find something else because I can't call the police or file any lawsuit against them because they're able to privately enforce that restrictive covenant. Now, what we know, uh, what we know happened is when we say that there was no police action or judicial action, that just was not true. We saw as communities began to become integrated in, in some ways, the police were there to squelch uh, to, you know, to watch some of these homes be firebombed, to watch some of the terrorizing that was occurring to, as uh, these neighborhoods started to become integrated. So to say that the police were not going to be involved, um, it just didn't really hold up, didn't really hold up at all. So we move on to, uh, to 1949. Just a year later, we've got the Housing Act of 1949. And what happened here is, as you know, when we were talking about how the you know, people were looking to escape these urban slums that were, that were there, the overcrowded conditions that were in the inner cities. And as the suburbs were created, people couldn't wait to invest in home ownership and move out um, in, in, into some of these homes. And that was great, but as we've just discussed, those opportunities were not available for everyone. So as white families were able to move out into the suburbs, um, that left behind black families and other minorities in these overcrowded slum conditions. So what we saw with the National Housing Act of 1949 was, uh, it, was, it, was work, it was it was passed in an effort to uh, sort of create uh, urban renewal, slum clearance and urban redevelopment. Okay, the slum clearance part uh, had been come to known as Negro clearance at the time because what Truman was doing there and what the the folks that he had would really work to um, it, it, it really worked to just destroy uh, some of these communities that were uh, the, the, that sense of community that was existing in some of these neighborhoods because there wasn't a real plan to get folks from where they were at to where they needed to go because segregation and housing discrimination is still in full force. So if you're tearing down the only home that I can live in, where am I going to go and live? That's the question. And that sort of led us to the creation of housing, um, um, uh, to, to, uh, to housing development projects. So this is Pruitt Igro. This one here is in St. Louis. This is an example, first one of the first examples of a high rise public housing development. This was in the city of St. Louis in 1940, 1954. Now, one of the things about, about, um, about public housing is that it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily, it, it wasn't necessarily about, um, you know, creating houses for the poor for them to just live their lives in. This was something that was created to help people get a hand up, meaning you move into the public housing development for a while while you're saving a little money, and then you go and buy a home. That's what was happening. That was happening for white families because African American families, I'll say it again, just did not have those opportunities. They just did not have those opportunities. And in fact, Pruitt Igo, you've got the Pruitt building was for African Americans. The Igo building was for white families. That's how it worked. But then as access to home ownership opportunities started to be created with the development of the suburbs, 
uh, the Eisenhower inter inter interstate system, all these things started to come into play. That gave an opportunity for the white families to get into that middle class where the African-American families did not have that opportunity because they were, they were denied housing. They were, so they were stuck in these slums, which, um, uh, which was reminiscent of something out of a Charles Dickens novel. Okay, the housing stock had deteriorated. It was just terrible. It was very terrible conditions there. So once the opportunity for African Americans to achieve home ownership and to move into different uh, uh, neighborhoods occurred, it was like, wow, I can't wait to get out of here. I can't wait to get out of here. So that's led in uh, another group of opportunists unfortunately, that further um, uh, created a racial divide in our community. And those folks we know as blockbusters. Now, blockbusting is inducing homeowners to sell at reduces, reduced prices by inferring that the imminent entry into their neighborhood of persons of a particular race or national origin are gonna devalue their properties, okay? That's what blockbusting is. And what we know, as we've just discussed, we're in a space where African Americans and other minorities cannot leave some of these neighborhoods that they're, that they're, that they're confined to. Um, and, and now all of a sudden, some of these opportunities are being created for them because of the 1948 Supreme Court decision that allowed for housing integration based on sort of saying that the restrictive covenants could be privately enforced. So some people said, hey, I don't have a problem. I'm gonna sell my home to whoever wants to buy it. And that's what was happening. But unfortunately, the blockbusters would step in and they would say, hey, did you see what just happened down the street? The, the Johnson family just sold their home to a black family, okay? You better sell me your home while you still can. And they would buy that home at a reduced price because they were, they were peddling this panic and fear and saying, look, you're, you're not gonna be able to sell this home if you don't do it right now. I'll give you 20% less than what it's worth, whatever the case may be, they were gonna do that. Now, now let's take a step back here. Let's take a step back because what we have to understand is the mentality of what was taking place with the homeowner. Okay, the homeowner at the time, this is what they know. Somebody knocks on their door, says you better sell me your house quick while you still can, while you still can. All right, that's an important statement and that was a true statement because as we discussed, the FHA was only lending in homogenized communities. They were not lending in integrated communities. So when the Johnson family sold their home to a black family down the street, all of a sudden the opportunity to obtain FHA financing is going away, is no longer going to be possible. So because of that, you better sell me your home while you still can because soon enough you won't be able to. All right, so that's one of the things that the blockbusters were doing. So they would buy these homes at these re reduced prices. Another thing, another thing we've got to remember is that we're talking about an all white community. Their only interaction with African Americans is what they saw on the newsreel. And what do you think you saw on the newsreel and on the television? It was not good. It was not good stuff that was taking place. So there was an innate fear that was occurring because when we don't live next to each other, we don't know each other. And the only thing that we can do is make assumptions about who we are, who they are. And instead of uh, us and we, it's them and they. And that's not what we're looking for, okay? And that's what the housing seg segregation has created in our communities that reverberates today all over our country. So we've got to keep that in mind. So the blockbusters, what the blockbusters would do, they then, so now they bought this home at a steep discount from the home seller, and then they, quote, sell it to an African-American family. Okay, they sell it, but they don't really sell it because they have these financing terms uh, called contract for deed. They can't sell it because the African-American can't get financing to buy a home in a predominantly white community. It just wasn't gonna happen. So the blockbuster says, don't worry, I'll take care of that for you. I'll give you these some great terms. So now they are selling these homes at twice the market value or 50% more than market value, whatever the case is, it's more than what the market value would have been. The exorbitant rates, okay? Uh, terrible terms. And this contract for deed, what it did was, let's say that you got a 10 year term, meaning that 
um, you, you know, if you're thinking, if you think about that in a fully amortized mortgage, at the end of 10 years, you've paid off the home. That's not how these contracts for deed worked. Well, how they worked is you don't accrue any home ownership until you've made your final payment, meaning that you could have a 10 year note and you could live in that place, pay your mortgage on time every month for nine and a half years. And the first month you're late, you can be evicted and you've not accrued any home ownership or any debt reduction. Okay. That's how that worked. And you, as you could imagine, there were a lot of surprise fees that were jumping in there. And there were a lot of things that were being done to trip up the African Americans and other minorities so that they would not be able to complete the purchase of that home so that the blockbuster could get it back and then turn around and sell it to somebody else or turn around and lease it to two or three or four black families at a time. Because again, you're going from a Charles Dickens novel to you know, living with two other families. That's an improvement. That's a big improvement. And the thirst and desire to get out of these urban slums was so great that people were taking advantage of every opportunity that they could to get out of there. And the blockbusters profited from that uh, on that fear peddling, which was unfortunate. And it's unfortunate in a variety of ways because it created the myth that when an African American moves in, it destroys the value of the neighborhood. What really destroyed the value of these neighborhoods was what the blockbusters were doing. And uh, because what we know is that African Americans often, when they were able to purchase a home in a neighborhood, they actually earned more uh, than the white families that were their neighbors because there were so few opportunities and options for them to invest in home ownership. They would take what they could get, and often that was a lesser home than what they could truly afford. And that leads us to 1959. So this was the Saturday Evening Post, and it was entitled "When a Negro Moves Next Door." This was an actual article that talked about what African Americans and Negroes um, wanted at the time. We want to cut our grass. They want to send their kids to school. They want to raise their families, live in a safe neighborhood, just like you, is basically what this article said. Estelle Sachs, who you see pictured there, she's a realtor in Baltimore, Maryland at the time. And she was saying, look, do not feed in to this panic that is being peddled by these blockbusters. Do not let them destroy your community, our communities. Allow integration. Black people are just like you. Negroes want to cut their grass and raise their families and live a quality life just like you. That's what she was saying. And it worked in some cases. In other cases, it just did not, unfortunately. So let's talk a little bit about Dr. King. Dr. King, who was very passionate about uh, housing, that he saw that as a huge issue. He said that the issues that we've got were environmental and not racial. The deprivation, the economic deprivation, social isolation, inadequate housing, and general despair of thousands of Negroes teeming in Northern and Western ghettos are the ready seeds which give birth to the tragic expressions of violence. And he was speaking about the Watts Rebellion at the time, which resulted in over 34 deaths, $40 million in property damage. Again, it's economic, not uh, racial. And that was the challenge that he was dealing with in that African Americans and others were dealing with at the time. And I say African Americans and others, it's everybody. It's all of us. It's all of us because we're all in this together. And as we realize that, we're going to make better decisions to create stronger communities that we can all be proud of. So here he is and the Freedom Festival. So the Freedom Festival in 1966, what was taking place? He went to Chicago. Went to Chicago because, as I stated earlier, I talked about how um, African Americans in the Great Migration were making their way north because they felt that there were going to be better opportunities there. What was determined, what, would, what they found in many cases, is that, the, 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 that there was more oppression in some of the northern states than they'd even experienced in the south. For example, Dr. King talks about housing. He said that um, he, when he moved to Chicago for the Freedom Festival to end slums and all of that, he rented an apartment. The only apartment that he was able to rent, of course, in an African American, a Negro community, uh, he was renting that for $50 a month. It was a three room shack. It had poor plumbing. It had, you know, it was dark and dingy. It was a shack that he was renting for 50 bucks a month. And when he was touring around and he would see the neighborhoods that white families were able to rent homes in, 
um, they would get five and six bedroom, uh, five and six room palatial apartments, tall ceilings, bright and airy, plenty of natural light coming in. And they were spending $40 a month on those, $40 a month. So what he was finding, which is probably no surprise to any of you, um, it was that African Americans were getting much less, but paying much more for the opportunity to have that. And that was a challenge. He said he never experienced as much violence than when he went to Chicago. First time he got hit in the head with a brick was in Chicago because they said, hey, you get back south and deal with what's going on there. Because the North was happy to wave their finger at the South and say, you need to treat your Negroes better, uh, but don't come up here to the North and sort of pull back the curtains about what we've got going on up here. That's what uh, Dr. King was encountering at the time. So that moves us to 1968. 1968, we have the uh, passage of the Federal Fair Housing Act. This is the Civil Rights Act of 1968. Now we talked about the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which was the very first Civil Rights Act, and we thought that that solved racism in our country. It didn't, but the 1968 Civil Rights Act, this is where we solved it, right? Okay, so we've got a uh, law, our Fair Housing Act, which prohibits discrimination based on race, color, religion, and national origin. Those were our original four protected classes. There we have it, 1968, racism over. Housing segregation ended forever. <sighs> yeah, yeah, if only that were so. If only that were so. We know that that didn't quite work out quite that way. All right, we move to 1968. We stay with 1968, I should say. And we have Jones versus Alfred H. Mayer Company. So this is another U.S. Supreme Court case that is used to define housing policy in our country. What happened here is the Jones family wanted to buy a home from a new home that was being constructed by the Alfred H. Mayer Company. This is a, Alfred H. Mayer said, no, you're black, can't sell you a house. Now, there's something to that. He said, I can't sell you a house. Hmm, interesting. What does that mean? What does that mean I can't sell you a house? Well, let's break that down a little bit. There could be a couple of factors in play there. Um, and this has been debated for many years. I, was, uh, I had an opportunity to take part in a panel discussion with um, descendants of both the Jones family and the Alfred H. Mayer Company talking about this very issue and the I can't sell you a house was debated about what that meant and what that means. Because what I would say is that a couple of things. One, I can't sell you a house because I have FHA financing to develop this neighborhood and FHA still is not insuring integrated neighborhoods and provided and financing for integrated neighborhoods. So I can't sell you a house because this is a white only neighborhood and I would be violating the terms of my FHA financing by doing that. That's one option. The other option is a sort of handshake agreement, a handshake agreement, even if it wasn't in a restrictive covenant, there is a unwritten rule that says this is a white neighborhood because the Alfred H. Mayer sells a home to an African-American family, that's probably gonna be the last home he sells because he violated the trust of the community that bought into it under, with the understanding that this is gonna be a white only community, okay? So a couple of those things happen. Now, the Supreme Court said, all right, not only do you have to sell the Jones family a house, but you have to pay all of their legal fees as well, which was a huge win because this case was argued before the passage of the Civil Rights Act, but it was decided after. So once the Civil Rights Act was passed, that gave the Supreme Court the grounds to say, hey, this is a no brainer here. Um, you must sell the home and you must pay for all these fees, which is, uh, uh, which is great. So that was 1968. So we now have proven that, we've proven that the Civil Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act of 1968 has some teeth to it. It works. Okay, so we're moving right along. We know that we've got a long way to go still, but uh, that was a huge win uh, 50 years ago, 52 years ago. And we just commemorated that not long ago, the 50 year anniversary two years ago. Um, and I say commemorate, not celebrate, because it's important to recognize that although we did 
come a long way since 1968 and since, well, I should say since 1866, we still have a long way to go. We have not arrived in creating equal housing opportunities in our communities all over the country. And it's up to us as Realtors to create those outcomes. So that takes us to 1974. We have the Housing Community Development Act of 1974. And what this did is it amended the Fair Housing Act to include gender as a protected class. I mean, can you believe that 1974? In 1974, I was able to, I could say, if someone, if a woman came to rent a house from me or buy a house in the neighborhood that I, I, that I was selling, I could say, ah, I'm not gonna sell you a house. Go get your dad, go get your brother. Go find a husband. I'll sell them a house. I'm not selling you one because you're a woman. Perfectly legal. 1974 wasn't very long ago. It is crazy that that was the case. But again, we take steps and we, the wheels of justice move slowly uh, as, we're, as, we're, as we're sort of moving forward. Um, that was 1974. Then we have the Fair Housing Amendments Act of 1988. This was the next um, the, the, the next group of folks that were added into the Fair Housing Act as protected classes. So this included uh, disability and familial status as additional protected classes. So this again, 1988, I can't do math very well. It's like 32 years ago, something like that. Anyway, it is not that long ago, which means that it would have been perfectly legal for someone to the refuse to rent an apartment to someone because they're in a wheelchair and say, hey, you're in a wheelchair, wheelchair scratch on my walls, I don't want to rent to you. Perfectly legal. I mean, think about that. It's probably, you probably have enough challenges being in a wheelchair and you also can't get housing because of that. Ridiculous. Paul Longmore said, prejudice is a far greater problem than any impairment. Discrimination is a bigger obstacle to overcome than any disability. Um, and that is what he said about, the, uh, about what was taking place at the time. Um, as Tessa mentioned at the beginning, I, I, I serve as president of the Metropolitan St. Louis Equal Housing Opportunity Council, and, which is a um, housing discrimination agency here in St. Louis. And um, you'd be surprised that how many cases are still coming across for handicap, disability. Disability is the number one, uh, the, the, the highest amount of cases that we see they, uh, you know, in, in, over any of the other protected classes that are in our, um, uh, that, are, that are federally recognized. Now, of course, as Realtors, we recognize two additional classes as uh, protected classes, and those are sexual orientation and gender identity. So those are the two additional classes that we as Realtors uh, agree to not discriminate against based on housing. However, those are not federally recognized as of yet. So that brings us to where we're at today as it relates to our federal protected classes. We have race, color, religion, a national origin, sex, disability, and familial status. Okay, so we've talked about the history a bit. Now, where does that leave us today? Where does that kind of leave us? I mean, it'd be easy to say that all of this stuff was a thing of the past, but what we know is that was not, that's not the case because as I said before, we our housing discrimination exists in a different way when before it was very overt racism that we were dealing with and overt discrimination. Now it's a lot more covert. An example would look something like this. So if what we know is that if this person calls to rent an apartment, he's gonna have a different experience than when this guy calls. And both of them are gonna have a different experience than when this guy calls, okay? And what we know that is, uh, we know that as linguistic profiling, because people are determining who is on the other end of the phone before letting them know whether or not housing is available. If you sound like you are a minority, then you may not have access to housing than if you sound like you are um, white. And when you show up to the apartment, sometimes what happens, because we've got this thing called code switching, where someone who is African American may work to sound as, quote, white as they can, and then they show up and all of a sudden the apartment that was promised to them is no longer available. Uh, unfortunate. If you're an African American, you have to spend over 50% more time to, uh, to uh, 
over 50% more time finding a house, uh, finding housing than a white family or a white person would. Uh, so again, that's just another, uh, another challenge that exists within the minority community uh, as it relates to uh, obtaining equal housing and upward mobility opportunities uh, in our country. So that leads us to the Texas Department of Community Affairs and versus the uh, Inclusive Communities Project. So this talked about, this was disparate impact. And what this talked about, this was another Supreme Court decision, which talked about that it showed that 92% of all housing, all low income housing tax credit projects were located in neighborhoods that were less than 50% Caucasian occupied. So they were, you know, and you see this, we see this all over the country. Again, this is no surprise that this happened. This is 2015, the Supreme Court decided that yes, you've got to do a better job at spreading this out because by continuing to stack more poor people on top of more poor people on top of more poor people, you're not creating the outcomes that uh, the community deserves, which leads us to 2016. We've got another uh, HUD case here. This one talks about the disparities in the US criminal justice system and how um, having rental policies that say, if you have, if you've ever been arrested or have any criminal record, then you're excluded from housing. So that turns that upside down and says that those policies have a disparate impact on protected classes. On their face, they're not discriminatory, but they have a disparate impact, a negative impact on a protected class. Uh, because what we see is that, what we know is that African-Americans make up just about 12% of the US population, but represent about 36% of the prison population. Now, uh, if we go all the way back to where I was talking about uh, after Reconstruction and after uh, the emancipation, we saw which sort of what sort of started this trend. And what we know is that our country uh, incarcerates more people than any other country in the world. Any place in the world, the United States percentage has a higher percentage of the population in prison than any other country in the world. Uh, that is something that we've got to ask ourselves: Why is that the case? So that leads us to to Bank of America and Wells Fargo versus the city of Miami. Now we all remember, or many of us that were, that were still around at the time, as I stated before, this is my 21st year as a realtor. Uh, and just like many of you, I'm helping buyers and sellers achieve their real estate goals. I was on a listing appointment yesterday. I'm gonna be showing some property this, uh, a little bit later this evening. Um, and what we saw is that the housing, um, the housing crisis and the Great Recession of 2008, what caused that? Well, we know that there were a lot of things that caused that, but one of the things that made it even worse was the predatory lending. Um, it's been shown, studies have clearly shown, and this Supreme Court case illustrates that as well, that banks and lending institutions were targeting African-American and other minority neighborhoods with predatory lending products. Okay, they were, they were targeting these communities with predatory lending products, whether it's to refinance um, or to purchase. Those are the things that were happening. And yeah, as we know, there were a lot of exotic products out there, option arms, you know, you've got a fixed rate this year or, your, or, or this month and it changes every month. So you're getting into the home and you've got a $300,000 house and it costs you $1,000 a month. And by the time you're a year into it, you're paying $3,000 a month all these things are happening. And what we know is that African-Americans are, uh, the rate of home ownership in the African-American community is less than 50%. In fact, today is about 43%, which is less than it was prior to the passage of the Fair Housing Act in 1968. The uh, Great Recession and the predatory lending that occurred in communities all over the country uh, leading up to 2008 destroyed all the housing gains that were created between 1968 and then, and that's unfortunate. So what this Supreme Court case said is that banks can sue these lenders for their predatory lending practices because they have destroyed so many communities within their cities. And that is a big win uh, and a big eye-opening thing that, that, that occurred there to say that this, was, that, that, that this was taking place. Now you talk about, sometimes people say, well, they should have known better. They should have known better. What I just said is that the rate of home ownership within the African-American community is less than 
So what that means is that if you are a first time home buyer or first time home owner, then you have a 50% or greater chance that you are a first generation first time home buyer. And that means something different because if your family has not exposed you to home ownership, you don't really know what that looks like and you don't know what to expect. Myself, I never lived in a home that we owned growing up. I didn't meet a realtor until I was an adult. So to say that I should know uh, about how much I'm supposed to be paying on this mortgage is ridiculous because I would be and others were trusting the lenders and the realtors who they thought had their best interest in mind. But clearly they didn't in many cases. And that's why we saw a lot of, um, a lot of destruction within our communities based on the predatory lending that was taking place. That leads us to um, Facebook. Welcome to Facebook. Anybody heard of Facebook? Yes, you probably heard of Facebook. And what we know there is there was a lot of discrimination taking place there. Again, I talk about the signs. I talk about covert racism. We want white tenants. And what does that look like today? Well, in 2016, this is what it looks like. It looks like marketing opportunities here. So this is in New York, behaviors, likely to move, um, interest, buying a house, first time home buyer, house hunting. Oh, and what you can do in Facebook is narrow your audience based on a multicultural affinity. So we're going to exclude African Americans, Asian Americans, Hispanics. So if we select this, it says your audience selection is great. And what was happening is if you're African American or one of these other minorities, you're never going to see the ad for housing that this person put up. You're never going to see the ad. So you don't even know that the housing is available because it's not available to you. Again, that is a crime. So we see uh, that HUD decided to take that up. HUD said, and I'm just gonna skip through a couple of these. They say the sim similar things that I just said. HUD filed a housing discrimination complaint against Facebook. So this was as of August, 2018. August, 2018, we're commemorating the passage, of the 50th anniversary of the passage of the Fair Housing Act, but yet, Facebook is still discriminating based on housing. And I say Facebook is discriminating. Facebook is allowing housing discrimination, okay? And what Facebook said is that, well, we're gonna change that, we're gonna stop that. You know, we're not really responsible for this anyway, but blah, 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 blah. Um, going, so HUD said, all right, we're gonna give you a shot to fix it. Came back March of 2019, last year, a year ago, 2019, HUD comes back and says, boom, Facebook, you're still discriminating. You're still allowing this stuff to work uh, in a discriminatory way in our communities. And um, using a, commu a, a computer to limit a person's housing choices can be just as discriminatory as slamming a door in somebody's face, as Secretary Carson said at the time. And it goes on and on. We see that in Zillow. Zillow, they're allowing totally Caucasian neighborhood. Here, they've got we're only leasing our property to white. If you're not white, don't apply, okay? Which is tragic. And you're telling me that these companies really can't solve that issue if they wanted to? Yes, they could if they wanted to. We've got to put more pressure on them and others to solve some of the challenges that they're allowing to exist in our communities. So let's take a look at a couple of others. We've got Airbnb. Uh, Airbnb, same thing. We've got housing discrimination there, Uber. Lyft, housing discrimination, racial discrimination, disability discrimination across the board. Now, a shining example of this is Airbnb. Airbnb took this very seriously. They said, you know what, we have to solve this problem because what they saw is that 15, you've got a 15% lower chance of being accepted if you have an African-American sounding name in Airbnb, okay? And what we know is that names and photos were the first thing that people saw. So what they did was they said, all right, we're gonna go out, we're gonna hire a uh, former US Attorney General, Eric Holder, we're gonna hire Laura Murphy from the ACLU, we're gonna roll, and then they rolled out this instant book system which says that you're going to agree to terms before your face and name are ever displayed. So that way you can't get, you don't have that, oh, um, you know, you've already agreed to these terms before any of that happens. Um, pictures are revealed once the terms are agreed upon. They've committed to a stronger non-discrimination policy. Uh, you know, what, what, what was said here, Brian Chesky, the CEO, said that at the heart of their mission is the idea that people are fundamentally good and that 
every community is a place where you can belong. And that is really what we need. We need people to step up and take ownership of some of the challenges that have been created and figure out how they can address them. You know, because individually, yes, we probably can't change the world, but when we put our minds together and we work together as a cohesive community and as realtors, we have an opportunity to create better outcomes and we can really change the world as a result of that. So um, that is a brief history, a really brief history of fair housing. So I hope that you got some value in that. I'd love to answer any questions. I know we've got a couple minutes left. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Nate. That was fantastic. Um, that was, it was just really well laid out as that timeline. Um, so far, the only question I've seen pop up in the chat is where do I get a copy of the recording? So I'm going to stall for just a moment and give people a chance to pop in any questions they might have. I wanted to shoot back to uh, when you were talking about the end of World War II, you said that um, there was an understanding that if, if everybody had home ownership, they would be more willing to take up arms to defend that. What that reminded me of is the 11th and 12th words in the preamble to the Realtor's Code of Ethics. Everybody knows the first five, under all is the land. But right after that, it says, upon its wise utilization and widely allocated ownership. Right in the top of our Code of Ethics, we say the more people that buy into the American dream, the stronger that dream is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, and it goes on to say that depends <clears throat> the, the, uh, the survival of free institutions and of <laughs> our civilization. Yes. You know? Um, and then uh, the other thing I thought that it was really interesting because, uh, you know, we, we had a, a fair housing summit last year. So I was aware that something like 52% of all HUD discrimination cases each year are disability, mm -hmm. um, which, which kind of goes against what people would assume. But that means we assume too much about fair housing rather than learning the facts about it. Um, but the quote you said, I thought was really, really important. It said, uh, discrimination is a bigger obstacle to overcome than disability. That, that was a really powerful quote. Okay, it looks like we do have one. Oh, it's a, it's a tough question, Nate. It says, what is the solution? <laughs> ah, great, I love it. Um, what, what are the solutions? So a couple of solutions that we've got there are, um, it's, 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 it really starts with understanding. We have to have an understanding of what, is crea what, what has created some of the challenges that we have today. And, and that's one of the reasons why I like to have this discussion about the brief history of fair housing, because it kind of outlines some of the things that have led us to where we're at right now. Because once we have that understanding of how we got here, then we are better prepared to uh, create solutions for our communities. So some of those solutions that we could look at is who is at the table? Who is at the table? Do you have diverse groups around the table as it relates to decisions that are being made? Um, you know, uh, what I know is that if you're not intentionally inclusive, you're unintentionally exclusive. So what, that, what we mean by that is if you walk into a room and everybody looks like you, whether this is at your board level, this is at your company level, you're probably not doing something that's going to create and attract uh, a level of diversity. And that's what you need to do is work to say, what am I doing or what am I not doing that could work to create the level of diversity that we, uh, that we need in our community or in our board, in our association, in our company? because all of those things have to happen. I think that it's unfair to think that, well, you know, everybody's free now. So if they want to be a part of our association, they can just come on in and get involved. But you've got to remember that if you are a minority and you walk into a room and nobody looks like you, then you might not feel as comfortable and as welcome. You may feel like this is not the place that is welcoming of me. Because it was as late, I mean, as late as the 70s, I, in, here in St. Louis, as late as the 70s, you, would be, you could be African-American, you would be forbidden from joining the association, as late as the 70s. So just because all of a sudden someone can join an association doesn't mean that they're going to run out to join it, okay? Just because, and just because the policy went away doesn't mean the attitude about joining that association went away. And that's what we continue to see. So I would encourage you to have uncomfortable conversations. You know, find people that are not like you to have conversations with about this. You know, bring a friend that is different 
to, uh, to, 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 to the company meeting, to the board meeting, do those things. And obviously right now it's a little different, a little tough with COVID, but in a quote normal sort of environment as we are sort of meeting and greeting people, think about, how, think about what areas of your lives you have that doesn't have a level of diversity within it. And that I think is the best way that we can affect the change that we, that we want. That's really great, Nate. And, and I think that your presentation did a really good job of showing the kind of decades long shadow that public policy can have. And it's important to understand, you have to look at how, how affecting public policy is so that you, you make better public policies going forward because you understand that they will have far reaching impact beyond just the policy itself. Mm -hmm. um, and I am still not seeing any more questions, just people raving about, about your presentation. Well, Tessa, you mentioned the policy, you know, that's the policy is extremely important, but it goes more than policy, because as I stated, we've had a policy on the books that housing discrimination has been illegal since 1866. Okay, we've had a policy in one way, shape or form. So it's more than just policy. And of course, when we look at the Fair Housing Act of 1968, that really codified it because everybody forgot what was said in 1866. Okay, but what we know is that for us to say that housing discrimination is ended just because that policy was passed, we know that, that is, that's, that's foolhardy. I mean, I don't have to tell the Long Island Board of Realtors about how that occurs because I know that there are challenges there. There's challenges everywhere. You know, I saw the Newsday report just as many of us did. And what I tell people all the time is that could be any board in our country. That could happen in most boards in our country because people are not educating themselves. People are not understanding that they may be unintentionally, um, um, you know, let me be clear. We've got plenty of folks that are intentionally segregating and, and, and intentionally discriminating. But I think that the challenge that we have uh, that is greater than that is the unintentional discrimination, the implicit bias, the decisions that people are making for their clients and customers because of who their client or customer is without giving the client or customer the opportunity to make their own decision. As Realtors, we provide the information, the client makes the decision, and we have to remember that, and I think that so often we are not operating in that space. We've got to work to adopt the equal professional services model that National Association of Realtors provides to help us streamline that process and make sure that we're providing equal professional services to everyone that we interact with. That's great. Do you have time for another question? Sure. Okay, this one's a two-parter. Uh, they want to know how agents can get more involved in promoting fair housing. Um, and then secondly, they want to know how they can contact you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, so I, I, if my, my screen is still up, then you can see that my contact information is right there. Uh, best way to reach me is through email, uh, nate at livingstl.com. I'm on Facebook and all that good stuff too. Feel free to connect with me there um, as well. Uh, so that's how you can connect with me. How you can get involved, um, you, I, I think that you can get involved in your, you can, you can start in your company. Uh, for example, I'm um, you know, here, uh, my company here in St. Louis, Red Key Realty Leaders, which is uh, one of the largest independent brokerages in St. Louis, about 180 agents. And what we've started doing is a um, sort of where do we go from here series where we're having conversations uh, every couple of weeks, just talking about some of these challenges that exist as it relates to diversity and inclusion. So just having those conversations, that's something that's happening um, here in our company and that's being spearheaded by an, another realtor here. So that's a place where you might get involved. Your association, getting involved there at your local association. If you've got a diversity committee or, um, or, or something like that, get involved there or start that, work to create that. Um, state, uh, your, your state association similarly, uh, work to create those, uh, those committees or get involved. And I know many of us have in our states have diversity and inclusion committees. Getting involved there um, is important. One of the things that that I, you know, and then of course at the national level, not only is there a diversity committee at the national level, but more importantly, right now, there, uh, you know, for the first time, there's a fair housing policy committee. Okay, fair housing policy. One of the things that I've been challenged with over uh, the last 15 years or so that I've been involved in association, um, in association business in that way is that the diversity committee so often do not reach the audience that they need to. It's a group of people pre preaching to the same group of people who 
don't necessarily need that education and understanding. I think that what we need is fair housing education and training being mandatory from our state licensing bodies, because only then are you going to make sure that the people that need that education get it in some way, shape, or form. Uh, because if it's just made voluntary or elective, then the folks that say they don't need it aren't going to come to it. And again, those are the folks that are most likely to benefit from it that really need it or they're going to have their eyes open. I know that for me, every time I give one of these presentations or instruct a continuing education course relating to fair housing, I always have someone come up, at least a couple of people and say, I have no idea. I had no idea that this was happening. I didn't know this took place. I didn't know that this is where we, this is how we got here. And it's because it was worth CE credit and it was the class that they was available for them. And that's why they got there. So we've got to figure out how can we create ways to get people in the room that otherwise would not be there. That's fantastic. I knew all the other questions are coming up or just, you know, how do I get engaged? How do I, how do I, how do I change things? How do I make it better? Yeah. Well, Nate, thank you so much for joining us today. It was really great to see you, and, and we appreciate your time and your information and this really great timeline. Thanks, Tessa, and uh, thanks to your, total, your whole association. I appreciate you guys giving me the opportunity to talk with you. I hope that you all got value out of the presentation today, and I look forward to seeing you all soon. All right. Thanks so much. And uh, to LIBOR members, we will have this up on lirealtor.com forward slash COVID no later than tomorrow. So if you missed it or if someone you know missed it and you think they should see it, tell them to go get it tomorrow. Thanks, Nate. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.